Good morning and uh, welcome to Orlando. My name is Jean-Marc Fix. I'm the chair of the Living to 100 Symposium. Uh, thanks for joining us to the latest edition of the Living to 100 Symposium. This is uh, version 7 uh, and it's almost 20 years ago that we had the first one in 2002. There's quite a few people in the audience that have been there at the first meeting. Could you raise your hand if you have been there at the first meeting? As you can say, thank you very much for your faithfulness in coming here. We have three busy days ahead of us full of fascinating ideas on longevity and its impact on the world. But first, I would like to thank our gold sponsors, AARP and Milliman, and our bronze sponsors, Genry, Hanover Re, and NMG Consulting. And also thanks to the financial reporting section, the product development section, the reinsurance section, and the committee on living on life insurance research for their support. I would also, also like to acknowledge two of the SOA research program, aging and retirement and mortality and longevity. In addition to the financial support and uh, moral support from all those organizations, I'd like to thank the many volunteers researchers and presenters that make this meeting possible. I want to extend a special thank you to the member of the committee and the SOA support staff that have worked for three years in making this symposium a reality. Members of the committee, Ronora Jan, if you could please stand if you're in the audience. Ronora is already standing. <laughs> thank you all. The committee members are very shy, obviously, because they're here, I know. Um, now I have the privilege to introduce Dr. Steve Horvath. His research lies at the intersection of aging research, epidemiology, chronic disease, epigenetics, genetics, and system biology. Dr. Horvath works on all aspects of biomarker development with a focus on genomic biomarkers of aging. He developed a highly accurate multi-tissue biomarker of aging known as the epigenetic clock, which he will discuss today with us. A couple of final points about Dr. Horvath. First, he's a biostatistician, and his initial PhD was in math, so he might have more in common with a room full of actuaries than a room full of medical doctors. And second, he published a book on a specific data analytics methodology, and that shows the more and more importance of data analytics, not just in the medical field, but in all the fields of uh, human research as of, to, as of today. Second, I wish to apologize for Dr. Horvath for scheduling him the first thing in the first session at 8 a.m. in the morning when he comes from California. Uh, so I apologize for that. And uh, let me introduce Dr. Horvath. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Good morning. Um, it's a real privilege to talk to you this morning. Um, I will talk about epigenetic clocks. And um, before I delve into math and data, I want to give you an intuitive feeling. Um, the left panel shows you the Vitruvian Man from Leonardo da Vinci, which depicts the perfect physical dimensions of the human body. But there was always the hope that one could develop and add a time axis. We would like to know what is the age of the liver, the heart, the skin, and so on. Now, that kind of question um, occupied me for many years. Um, in the end, I was very lucky to stumble across uh, something known as DNA methylation, chemical modifications of the DNA molecule. And that's kind of depicted in the middle. So the DNA is not just the carrier of the genetic information, but as I hope to convince you, it's actually one gigantic aging clock. It allows you to measure ages of all cells that contain DNA. The right panel um, is probably um, very familiar to you as being actuaries. This is just a visualization of mortality, the grim reaper. And the Grim Reaper often has this hourglass, you know, the, um, the passage of time is measured in an hourglass. And the hope is, of course, that we can uh, develop s such hourglasses so that we can know when, is, when, when um, our time is up. 
Why? Because we want to fight that, you know. And um, my own research tries to address several fundamental questions. And the first is, how do we measure aging? And in this talk, I will obviously focus on so-called epigenetic clocks, but I do want to mention there are many other biomarkers one can develop and think of. The other question that motivates my research is to figure out why is it that people age even if they follow the perfect lifestyle. Let's say you do everything right, you exercise and have no stress and everything, why do you age? And um, my research and that of many others shows that yes, epigenetic changes play a role in that. Um, I'm an aging researcher and I'm very much motivated by the third question. How do we measure the beneficial effect of an anti-aging strategy? Imagine you have a cure, quote unquote, against aging or some pills. How do you measure that it's actually effective? Um, how do you measure it in the context of a human clinical trial? And again, I um, will advocate for the use of epigenetic clocks, but again, I emphasize in, in reality, you need many additional biomarkers. The final question is, um, is really comparative biology. Why do some animals live long lives while others live short lives? Why is it that a mouse lives three years and a human being up to 122 years? Why? And um, I will show you some data that, again, argue epigenetics plays a role. So before we go into it, I want to give you my uh, conceptual framework. On the left-hand side, you see what we call chronologic age. That's literally your or calendar age. On the right-hand side, you see mortality, morbidity. And um, the question is really to explain that very strong relationship between chronologic age and mortality and morbidity. And the, um, I think of it in two, uh, that there are two uh, um, avenues to uh, link these. The upper one is what I call innate aging processes, and that's deliberately vague. There are some processes in your body that really drive mortality risk, independent of the perfect lifestyle. You do everything right, something still ages. That's what I call the innate aging process. On the lower um, branch, you see um, various um, toxic exposures. So yes, people smoke, some people are obese, infections, in environment, bad things happen, you know. They also relate strongly to mortality and morbidity. Now, um, in my research, I'm trying to uh, develop these molecular biomarkers, and they are on the, my hope is that they are strongly related to innate aging processes, but then other biomarkers um, uh, very much relate to these toxic exposures. For example, of course you can um, use methylation to measure um, smoking history, for example. And um, if you're a mathematician and you look at this diagram, you, you feel the situation is hopeless It's um, because it involves um, um, hidden variables. But um, the one thing that is clear, uh, um, stepping back, the, there is a very strong relationship between chronological age and innate aging. And that's very much my starting point. You cannot argue with that. So therefore, the, the strategy is, well, look for biomarkers that have a very strong correlation with chronologic age chances are these biomarkers probably relate to innate aging. But that has to be tested then. So um, I want to give you a basic introduction to epigenetic clocks. So what is an epigenetic change? There are many definitions of epigenetics. Here I will have a very simple definition, which is simply a chemical modification of the DNA molecule. You remember the DNA has four letters, A, C, T, G, and if there's certain chemical modifications, that's epigenetics. And um, now the 
the reason why I'm speaking here today is because of an insight. Yes, epigenetic changes allow you to define very accurate measures of chronologic age. But more than that, you can also develop mortality risk estimators, so predictors of lifespan, and I'll show you that. But epigenetics can do more. It can measure smoking history and, and various other um, exposures. Many people think of epigenetics as something that happens from the environment on the genome. But I do want to say genetics plays a huge role. To give you a number, heritability is at least 40 percent, you know. So, um, and, and that brings us to the topic of centenarians. Later I will show you that centenarians have uh, a genetic um, uh, um, advantage in the sense of um, they, they have slower epigenetic clocks. So in my entire talk I will focus on one epigenetic modification, which is DNA methylation. But I do want to emphasize there are many, uh, several others. But um, DNA methylation is very popular because you can measure it very accurately. And more specifically, it's known as cytosine methylation. Um, remember, there are four letters in the DNA, A, C, T, G. The letter C is the cytosine. And occasionally, a methyl group attaches to it. And you see um, these, um, the image of it. Now, cytosine methylation plays an absolutely essential role in development. A zygote would never develop to an embryo um, if you didn't have methylation. In general, also methylation stabilizes the genome. It prevents cancer and so on. Now, in, um, that role of methylation is, is beyond debate. It's understood. But the more recent insight, um, and uh, having said that, it goes back to the 70s, but <laughs> uh, uh, there's increasing evidence that methylation actually also plays a very important role in aging. You know. So um, I, in my research, I use uh, typically an array, but there's many ways of measuring methylation, and in certain ways there are companies that compete with different technology. But I use typically the so-called Illumina methylation array, um, the latest version um, measures about 860,000 locations in the genome. Um, these locations are called CPG, um, cytosine phosphate guanine. But um, um, CPGs um, give you a number between zero and one. I want to very briefly tell you about the costs of that array. So at UCLA, um, I get a research rate, and I think... Um, my rate would be, with everything included, about $200. In other words, if you gave me a blood sample, then my costs for generating the methylation data for that one blood sample is, um, no, if you give me a DNA sample, sorry, it's $200, you know. So the t these tests are not cheap, you know. Um, um, I'm, of course, among other things, a, a biostatistician, and these are the kinds of data I get. So I give you here an excerpt of an Excel spreadsheet. And the rows are the cytosines. These are probe identifiers. And the data set would have 866,000 rows. And the columns are the, the people, person one, person two, person three. Um, when you look at the numbers, you will notice each number is, lies between 0 and 1. And so one way to interpret these numbers are as proportions. Proportion of chromosomes that are methylated. So to be very precise, imagine you have a blood sample. There are million cells. So there's a couple of million um, um, chromosomes. And then you can ask, what proportion of chromosomes is methylated at one location? So that's where the proportion comes from. These are my data. And my task is I want to use this data to predict or to estimate the age. And you can imagine that's a regression task because for every person I know the age at the time of the blood draw. And so my tools are, uh, in principle, you would just say, well, why don't we just use ordinary least squares regression? So here the dependent variable is age, 
And then you have the covariates would be maybe 860,000 60, covariates, you know, and now you need to um, um, estimate the coefficients, the beta. The problem is there are way too many covariates. You need to think about what to do. And there is a straightforward solution in statistics, which is known as penalized regression. And there are many penalized regression models, but famous ones are rich regression, but that's not what I use. I use elastic net regression. But now, um, careful if you are quantitative, look at the formula. So this is the sum over the squares. But in rich regression, something changes. The blue term changes. You notice um, there is a so-called penalization um, term, which is known as the L2 norm in the coefficients. Th that's why it's called penalization uh, um, penalized regression. And there's a parameter, the so-called lambda, that determines how much you penalize covariates. And um, these parameters, uh, lambda, is chosen using a cross-validation approach. So rich regression has been around for decades, but um, um, I don't use it. And what I use is another technique, which is known as elastic net regression, which was developed by a group of Stanford uh, faculty. Notice what has changed. The red term has been added. This is the, the so-called L1 norm. So you see on the left panel the sums of squares of the data, but then the beta, the coefficient values, um, encounter two um, penalization terms. And um, the magic of it is that this then um, results, in essence, in a variable selection. You may start with 860,000 covariates, but after you run that regression analysis, you may end up with 350, you know. So I want to describe how I uh, developed the so-called pan-tissue epigenetic clock. The pan-tissue, because it applies to all... Um, tissues of the body. Um, I actually didn't have any research funding, but rather I downloaded publicly and freely available data sets that were from the internet. And um, so in total I had um, about 7,800 arrays, and they came from many different studies, 82 different scientific studies. And I applied then this elastic net regression on age, and in the end, the elastic net regression said it automatically selected the 353 um, CPGs by minimizing this term, right? So the CPGs were um, selected using a mathematical criterion, a minimization algorithm, which is good in terms of it gives me best predictive accuracy in a mathematical sense, but it has a drawback, which is biologists have a hard time interpreting the results. Biologists think in terms of pathways and not in terms of optimization methods. So the pan-tissue clock, in the end, it can be implemented in a three-step algorithm. You you'd measure methylation in 353 locations on the genome. You don't need to measure it in 860,000. In step two, you form a weighted average of these CPGs. Where do the weights come from? Well, these are the coefficient values of the regression model, the betas. And in step three, I actually transform it. Um, I, I didn't highlight that, but I transform the estimate so that it's in units of years. Um, and the result is then known as epigenetic age. Um, so exa example is you give me a blood sample, Hopefully, I find that your epigenetic age is 29, and, um, but it, that could be different from your chronological age. You know? Now, the remarkable thing from a biological point of view is that this is the same algorithm for every tissue and cell type. So this algorithm works not just in blood. It works on skin samples. Urine, you can extract DNA from urine, saliva, buccal swaps, um, really many so, um, 
adipo fat tissue is often, uh, or if you um, sometimes people even um, collect biopsy samples of muscle. So it really um, applies the same algorithms, the same coefficient values um, applies. Here I show you some data of this pan tissue clock. The scatter plot shows how the methylation age correlates with chronologic age. Um, and you see a very high correlation. Um, why is the correlation so high? Because I had ages from age 0 to 100. Um, if I evaluated middle-aged people, for example, people between 40 and 70, um, then the correlation would be much lower. It would be maybe 0 0.6 or 0 0.5. Um, here I show you some results from a centenarian study. Maybe we look first at the right panel. Carefully look at the x-axis. What you will notice is that um, there are many samples that are super centenarians. So here I was very fortunate to analyze blood sample from people who are 110 years and older, and of course younger people. And what you notice is that the methylation age estimate on the y-axis actually underestimates the ages, you know. So um, my current epigenetic clocks underestimate um, the ages of centenarians. And um, the same is true in the upper left panel. So here's another scatter plot, another study of centenarians and supercentenarians. And the red dots are the supercentenarian. Again, you see my estimator underestimates the ages. Now, there are two explanations for it. Um, one is a statistical explanation. You could say, when I developed these estimators, my training data didn't contain enough supercentenarians. So for, uh, this is a famous regression to the mean effect, right? It underestimates then the ages. Um, but then there is another explanation which biologists would like to f um, propose, which is, well, maybe the clock is accurate. However, these centenarians are actually biologically younger, right? So um, that would be a very nice interpretation, which goes to the next step. It would be nice if one could argue that methylation age measures an aspect of biologic age, of physiologic age, not just chronologic age, you know. And now, how would one test this hypothesis in a centenarian study? Uh, or let me, uh, uh, the, the hypothesis is the following. Centenarians um, age more slowly than others, non-centenarians, when you measure aging using the epigenetic clock. That's the hypothesis. How, how do you do it rigorously? There's really only one way to do it, and this is you need to actually look at the offspring of centenarians, okay? <laughs> Why? Um, it has to do with uh, confounding. What, um, what, you, what you want to do is you want to look at the offspring of centenarians that may be in their 70s and compare them to offspring of non-centenarians. Why? Because you have a two-group comparison and they are both age-matched groups. Now you can ask, well, which group has slower epigenetic age? You know? And that's exactly uh, what I did in the lower panel. So here, um, so, um, and also in the left-hand side, I want to uh, explain the colors. You see orange dots. The orange dots are bl blood samples from offspring of centenarians, whereas the gray dots are blood samples from regular folks. And what you see is clearly the offspring of centenarians, they have an epigenetic age that's actually lower than that of the controls. So yes, um, a centenarian seem to have an epigenetic advantage. Um, here I show you another study of uh, centenarians. So um, I was fortunate to uh, get access to a lady who, uh, who, who passed away at age 112, and she had kindly donated her, her body to research. And they asked me, what organs do you want to analyze? And I, I, um, I th thought of 30 different parts of the body. 
which, by the way, is a difficult exercise that you can play. How many tissues can you write down in an email in about five minutes? You know, so. <laughs> But anyway, so um, the upper panel shows you these 30 body parts, and you can ask, well, which body part was the youngest, according to the pan tissue clock? And on the left-hand side, you see this turquoise bar, and that's a cerebellum. This is a part in the back of your brain. It plays a role in um, uh, uh, motor fine-tuning. So yes, in, in that study of 112-year-old, the cerebellum and more generally brain regions actually aged more slowly. But then I had access to brains from five additional supercentenarians, um, and, um, and always the cerebellum stood out as aging more slowly. So I'm actually 100% sure that yes, the cerebellum is the body part that ages most slowly. And um, why is that interesting? Because, um, well, if we can figure out what, what does the cerebellum do right, you know, <laughs> it may inform the other tissues as well. But uh, the cerebellum contains lots of uh, neurons, a very high density and a special type of neuron. So it's really quite different from other brain regions. More generally, you can apply, of course, the epigenetic clock to all these body parts. And um, I did that. And the, the one body part, um, the question is, which body part ages the fastest? Okay? And the, it's really female breast tissue. So here I show you a study where um, we applied um, the epigenetic clocks to breast tissue samples and blood samples from the same women. So we had... Um, this was part of a breast cancer study, um, but I want to emphasize none of these women had breast cancer. It was a screening uh, study from the Komen tissue bank. And um, so what do you see? The red dots always lie above the black dots. What does that mean? The breast tissue in these women is really always older, you know, than their blood samples. Um, we can again ask, why is that? Um, I would bet that it has to do with hormone exposure, proliferation of breast cells, and so on. Let's come to another question, obesity. Um, what's the effect of obesity on epigenetic aging? And here I show you, um, in the upper panels, I show you how methylation age relates to chronologic age in various tissues. Um, the left panel shows you liver, then we have adipose, meaning fat tissue, muscle, and blood. Um, let's now um, think like statistician. Let's look at the upper left panel, um, the liver. You can put a regression line through that graph. And what's the interpretation? All the samples above the regression line age faster. Um, conversely, all the... Um, sample below the regression line age more slowly than the average. In certain ways, the re regression line represents the average. And if I ask you, how do you measure deviations from the regression line, you will say, well, form a residual, you know, from a, and that's exactly what we do. So we form a residual, and that residual is independent of chronologic age by mathematical definition. And in the lower panels, we relate the residual to body mass index. By the way, the residual has a name. We call it age acceleration measure. So we relate this age acceleration measure to body mass index. And in the lower panel, you see a correlation um, about 0.4. What we notice is obese people have liver samples that age faster. You know, that's the insight. Um, we looked at the other tissues, and in the right panel, you, uh, rightmost panel, you see the results for blood. And at the time, we didn't see anything significant. And there was a reason for it. The sample size was too low. Because later, we um, repeated the study with larger sample sizes, and we did find Again, obesity accelerates epigenetic aging in blood. But this um, study makes an important point. When you look at aging effects, 
they are often organ specific. For example, as I mentioned, there is a um, strong relationship in liver, but a very, or at best a very weak relationship in blood. So um, I'm in the aging field, and there was a nice publication in 2011 where um, it was a wish list from, um, of um, biomarkers of aging. And, um, and this organization, AFA, said a biomarker of aging must predict a person's physiological, cognitive, and physical function in an age-related way, it must predict the future onset of age-related conditions and diseases and do so independently of chronologic age. And that kind of criterion very much motivated my research for maybe the last seven years or so um, after publishing these epigenetic clocks. So the short story is there is no more question about the. Uh, this criterion, which is, um, yes, epigenetic clocks and more generally methylation predict mortality risk after you adjust for age, sex, and many other covariates, you know. So yes, they predict, in an epidemiological sense, they predict, meaning if you have a reasonably large sample size, you will find that epigenetic clocks predict how long someone lives. Um, I, I want to now um, delve a little bit into math um, because um, when, I, um, when I develop mortality risk predictors, I distinguish two types of approaches. Um, the first one is rather direct. So let's say you have time to death information. You can just use a regression model to regress the time to death information on these cytosines directly. Um, however, in, um, I will, I'm about to show you results for the so-called two-step model, which is in, it, um, in step one, you first aggregate the methylation into biomarkers. And only in step two do you relate the mortality information to these aggregated measures, okay? To, to be very concrete, I mentioned repeatedly you can use methylation to estimate smoking history, smoking pack years, for example. So then a two-step model would regress time to death on the smoking estimator and not on cytosines directly. You know. And um, this brings me to this... Um, uh, what our best predictor of mortality was named after the Grim Reaper. Um, uh, so it's called DNA methylation Grim H. Um, and it's a two step model. So in the middle of the circle, you see time to death. I, why do I have this information, by the way? Well, because I evaluate epidemiological cohorts. For example, in the Framingham Heart Study, people collected blood samples in the 1990s, put them in the freezer, and then for each person we know, well, what did they die from? How long did they live? Are they still alive? So I have time to death information. And, but I can go back to the freezers and um, somebody generated methylation data. And so um, what we uh, did, uh, Ake Lu in my lab, she developed these surrogate markers, uh, in the bottom you see smoking pack years, but also of various plasma proteins. Um, I'm not sure whether you recognize some of these markers, but um, this, uh, on the left you see this so-called PI1. This is plasminogen activator inhibitor 1. That's a plasma protein that keeps coming up in, our, in aging studies. However, our estimator of these proteins is strictly based on cytosines, okay? Don't get misled, you know. You see proteins, but it is an epigenetic biomarker. Um, yeah, and so we used then an, a COX model to regress um, these um, methylation markers on, um, yeah, which brings me to COX regression. Um, just a quick show of hands. How many of you uh, use Cox regression models? Oh, it's a lot. Okay. I thought um, I'm impressed because um, I thought you didn't know the technique. <laughs> um, 
um, because I think Gompert's regression is so much better, you know. So, but <laughs> you um, you lost respect, you know. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, no, I always use Cox regression. That's a poor's man's uh, way of modeling uh, lifespan data, right? Um, it's a semi-parametric model, and um, the great advantage of Cox regression. For, for a biostatistician, the great advantage is that you don't need to specify the baseline mortality rate, you know. So um, it allows you to model um, this so-called hazard ratio, which, which is a ratio of mortality rates. And um, the reason why, um, in theory, one would like other tab um, techniques is that in your world, you need absolute mortality risk, but in my world, a relative mortality risk is good enough. My world is biomedical research. You know. So, um, just to remind everybody, so when you, you get the Cox regression model um, gives you estimates of these hazard ratios. So let it be, I get a hazard ratio of 1.1 for this grim age, then the interpretation is that um, the, it, um, one year increase in grim age is associated with a 10% increase in mortality risk, which doesn't sound like much. But it isn't much because we're talking about one year increase in grim age. What if you have an eight year increase in grim age? Um, then you raise this hazard ratio of 1.1 to a power, the eighth power, and suddenly you get a um, hazard ratio of over two. So meaning that a person whose grim age is older than eight, they have more than double the mortality risk of um, the average. And eight is about the number of uh, the fifth percentile. Um, some people in the fifth percentile, 5% um, of you will have a grim age eight or more. Conversely, 5% of you will have a grim age minus eight, you know. So, uh, um, so in this sense, uh, some people are blessed. Um, I analyzed my own grim age, I'm right smack the average, so I yeah. <laughs> am. Um, and um, I want to say I, I have an identical twin brother, and actually I measured that as part of our birthday celebration. So, um, so, <laughs> which, um, and his grim age was up to the decimal the same as mine, which blew me away. So, you know, my grim age at the time was, I think, 48.9, and my brother Marcus, 48.9. I mean, it's mind-boggling, you know. So, yeah, in general, twins have similar um, ages. You know. Coming back to what I said, genetics plays an important role. Yeah. Um, now, here I show you um, a meta-analysis just to convince you that um, I do my homework. Um, so, uh, you see sample sizes, and um, so uh, these are different cohorts. So, Framing M Heart Study, Women Health Initiative, Jackson Heart Study. We have different uh, ethnic groups, European ancestry, African ancestry, Hispanics. And um, he, um, this meta-analysis plot shows you the hazard ratio associated with one year increase in GRIM, in this GRIM age. And what you see is it's about 0.1 across all groups. Now, in your world, you would now be interested in the following question. What about if I apply grim age to people who never smoked? Would it predict lifespan? Mm -hmm. Answer is yes. What about if I predicted to heavy smokers? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so you can form any stratum you want. Heavy smoking young women. Young meaning, let's say, younger than 50 or older, heavy smoker, obese. In any stratum you fit, uh, you come up with, grim age would predict lifespan. Why do I know it? Because I've done that. You know. um, now, I want to um, t come to a little bit of a technical discussion, uh, again, of these measures of age acceleration, because you hear that a lot. What is it? Well, these are Adjust, these are measures that adjust for age at the time of a blood draw, for example, and possibly sex, you know. So um, at the very least, as I mentioned, um, 
in, we form um, measures of age acceleration by forming residuals, raw residuals, by regressing the biomark on age. But in case of grim age, it would also be imperative to um, adjust for sex because sex um, is an explicit covariate in the model. Um, so when I make statements such as obesity accelerates aging, what I should it really refers to this age-adjusted, sex-adjusted analysis. Or if I say epigenetic clocks predict lifespan, it always means I use these residuals because um, so I, I um, remove the trivial effects from age and, uh, and um, sex. Which brings us now to another study. Should you follow a healthy lifestyle? And um, we looked at that uh, question using GRIMAGE, our best predictor of mortality. And you see, um, and, and the first row shows so-called mean carotenoid levels. So what is that? This is a blood-based me measure of how, um, how many vegetables you eat, you know. And I should emphasize, you need it because people have these self-reported measures and they really don't work. So let's come to that. <laughs> so this is a study from the Women's Health Initiative. Carefully look at the correlation and p-value of mean carotenoid. Um, correlation minus 0.26 means it's protective. P-value 10 to the minus 39. Um, hugely significant. Um, however, when we looked at self-reported vegetable intake, the p-value was 0.05, okay? <laughs> it, there was barely any effect. Uh, why people fill out these questionnaires in, uh, in an inaccurate way, inadvertently? The middle panel shows you many um, um, biomarkers that um, the doctor orders during your annual exam. C-reactive protein is associated with faster um, epigenetic aging, insulin level, glucose levels, triglycerides, everything related to metabolic syndrome, diabetes, um, and you see body mass index, all of these relate to faster grim age. At the bottom, you see smoking, correlation 0.44. Well, by construction, grim age was constructed to um, uh, track smoking, you know, so um, yes, a very strong relationship. Income, interestingly, also relates um, exercise, education. Now, when I say we find these associations in blood, um, they, they are beyond debate based on the p-values, very significant, 10 to the minus 10 and so on. But notice that we used over 4,000 blood samples when it comes to education, for example. You know? And so when you have such a large sample size, of course, you find significant results. Um, the correlation coefficient is very weak, minus 0.09. You know, so for an individual to slow your aging, you uh, um, you really um, can't educate yourself enough. It will not matter for you. Okay, or I should say, read more books. You know, so you. <laughs> but it's negligible. You know. At least in blood. I mean, to me, the miracle is why is it that if somebody is more educated, I even detect anything on the methylation in blood? Why would there be a connection? You know. So, um, um, yeah. But coming back to why are these studies interesting? Well, of course, you know that a healthy lifestyle is. Um, is good for you. Why do you know it? Well, because people have done decades of research on it. But what did I do here? I did a so-called cross-sectional study. I didn't, um, this cross-sectional study could have been done in about a year, you know. So arguably, we could have saved ourselves um, from um, funding decades of epidemiological studies of follow-up information where people had to follow people for 20 years to detect that vegetable intakes is um, good, you know. And that's the promise of these biomarkers. They allow you to um, come up with f faster and cheaper studies. We also had um, computer tomography data, and um, so we found that liver um, 
fatty liver was very much associated with accelerated grim age. And um, another group in, um, in Scotland, um, they looked at cognitive assessments in people in their 70s, okay? And um, on these people, they measured brain volumes. And what they found is that people who had an older grim age, whose blood was older, they actually had smaller brain volumes. And that's really quite remarkable because to me that's unexpected. Why would blood relate to brain functioning? But not just was there an, an, uh, an correlation with brain volumes, but also there were the expected associations with cognitive assessments, memory tests. So yes, people who had um, a younger grim age, they performed better at various um, um, cognitive tests. And, by, and even IQ. So, so let's discuss grim age. Um, the grim age, as indicated by its name, really stands out among pre-existing epigenetic clocks in terms of predictive ability for time to death, I didn't mention time to coronary heart disease. It very much predicts that. Uh, even time to cancer. It also relates to early age at menopause. Women who have experienced menopause earlier have a slightly elevated grim age. What I didn't mention is that um, our, we had a surprising finding. So our methylation-based um, estimator of smoking pack years actually outperformed self-reported pack years in predicting lifespan, you know. And, um, and not just in our data, this has been replicated in three other uh, publications, you know. So interestingly, somebody comes to you and says, I've smoked um, one pack e each day for the last 20 years. Um, I take a blood draw, measure their smoking history, and now there's a question, well, which one is a better estimator of mortality risk? And I can tell you it's the methylation marker, um, at least in these epidemiological studies. Um, I didn't mention, um, remember we have estimators of um, plasma proteins, and some of them are also very exciting. For example, our methylation marker of this plasminogen activator inhibitor 1 really stands out with um, relating to type 2 diabetes and um, fatty liver and so on. Now, clearly I'm an advocate of epigenetic clocks, but I want to provide everyone a reality check. They certainly do not stand out in terms of lifespan prediction. There are many alternatives, and you use them every day, probably. Um, blood pressure would be a phenomenal predictor of lifespan. Smoking, various frailty indices, lipid levels, glucose levels, all of that also predicts lifespan. Now, what I will say, though, is that these epigenetic clocks enhance these standard lifespan predictors. So if you have a battery of uh, risk factors, epigenetic clocks would be, could be added to this battery. Um, the great advantage of epigenetic clocks for an aging researcher is that they must relate to at least one root cause of aging, coming back to this idea innate aging processes. They, they must relate to these innate aging processes and, uh, and, and also they can be applied to cells in a dish. You know, so I don't need a living organism. I, I just, um, some fibroblasts or keratinocytes would work. Um, so what do epigenetic clocks teach us about anti-aging strategies? I mentioned healthy lifestyle. I want to um, come to a study we published a couple of months ago, um, which described a cocktail of drugs that, um, and the title of the paper says it all, Reversal of Epigenetic Aging and Immunosenescent Trends in Humans, Emphasis in Humans, because you will see lots of uh, studies that involve mice, but what about humans? And this was really um, developed by Greg Fahey, the first author, and so Greg Fahey wanted to uh, develop a, uh, a treatment for regenerating the so-called thymus gland. Um, the thymus 
plays a very important role very early in life. Um, um, it, it educates your blood cells, the so-called T cells in your blood. T cell mean thymus educated cell. And um, after puberty, the thymus fills up with fat, stops working. And so Greg Fahey experimented on himself, um, a study of one, and injected various things like growth hormones, DHEA, metformin, and also supplements, and came up with this uh, cocktail that actually replaced the fat mass in the thymus. But um, this treatment had a very positive side effect. It actually rejuvenated epigenetic age. And here I show you the data. Each panel is a different epigenetic clock. And the x-axis shows you months um, from the trial onset. And what you notice is um, after 12 months, so these people um, underwent this treatment for 12 months, you see how the epigenetic age really goes down systematically no matter what clock I use. You know? And the grim age clock is in the lower left panel and very excitingly there was an age reversal of two and a half years. You know? Now um, many of you will say well eight, an age reversal of two years is simply not good enough for me. Okay? <laughs> People get greedy. You know? But um, you need to look at it in a <laughs> you need to look at it differently. On some level what has happened is um, and, and there are lots of caveats, but let's just talk like mathematicians for a second. What has happened is aging has been stopped, right? Because if after a year you reverse aging by two years, what has happened? You stopped aging, right? So um, now um, also if um, we looked at the thymus, the, in, uh, the treatment did what it was supposed to do. It actually replaced the fat mass by functional tissue. And various biomarkers showed improvement. Here I just show you one, the EGFR levels improved kidney function in these people. You know. And also C-reactive protein, which measures inflam aging, um, it was also improved. And this is the craziest thing. There was one participant who had gray hair and then <laughs> there was repigmentation, you know. So, and um, initially I always thought it's just totally anecdotal, but um, I've learned when you improve immune system, actually it often uh, leads to repigmentation. You know, it's a well-known effect. So um, before we get overly excited, let me, <laughs> let me um, mention the, the great limitation was it was nine individuals, okay? Nine men aged between 50 and 65. Why? Because it was a phase one clinical trial. It was meant to establish safety. It wasn't meant to establish efficacy, okay? Now, the good news is um, in, in a couple of weeks, Greg Fahey will now start the second clinical trial, which will have um, uh, up to 100 people, you know, much larger sample size, more rigorous. So in a, in a couple of years, we will know whether this finding was real, you know. And, um, okay, so the limitations, were, another limitation was there was no placebo arm, you know. Now, but on another level, uh, there was a lot um, to be said about this trial, which there was deep phenotyping. We had methylation data from five different blood draws, two blood draws before the treatment, three after. Mm -hmm. We also looked at many other biomarkers, blood cell composition, blood counts, MRI data, and all biomarkers indicated rejuvenation. The great promise is that this is a human treatment that involves relatively safe substances. I'm saying relatively, like growth hormone has been used by many people, metformin has been used in the context of diabetes, DHEA. So overall, these are not outlandish substances. The rejuvenation effect, if it is real, is strong, because if you get statistically significant results in nine people, that's a strong effect. You know? So yeah, now um, there's another strategy um, um, that you can apply, which is, um, that's now a dangerous strategy, but let's say the, re um, the cocktail doesn't work. 
there is something called hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. I don't advocate it, but the data are quite strong, and I, I want to show that. So some people have a very severe form of leukemia, and they require then um, radiation treatment that destroys their st um, uh, stem cells and the bone marrow. And then um, they need a bone marrow transplant, a hematopoietic stem cell transplant. And the question you need to ask yourself is, well, after the blood reconstitutes itself, after the transplant, what is the age of the blood? Is it the age of the recipient or is it the age of the donor, right? So to be very specific, let's say you are 50 year old, you get a stem cell transplant from a 20 year old. Then a year later you ask the question, well, how old is my blood? Is it 21 because my donor is now 21 or is it 51 because I'm 51, you know? And um, the answer is clear without any debate. It's the age of the donor, you know. That's the miracle. So here I show you the data. So the y-axis shows you the methylation age of the recipient, but the x-axis is actually the chronologic age of the donor. And, and you, clearly it's all about the donor age. And what is remarkable about this particular study is that we had follow-up information of people 17 years later past the bone marrow transplant. So this effect persisted. You know. And this, of course, gives rise to a, 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 a gruesome idea, which is you harvest the bone marrow from your children. Or, <laughs> or in my case, from the undergraduates in my lab. You know, so <laughs> but... Um, um, this idea, of course, um, the prob there's many r problems with that idea, but um, um, there's a, um, a bone marrow transplant is very dangerous, you know. Um, unfortunately, people even die within a month, so it, it's, a very, it's really a procedure of last resort, you know. And um, the uh, one thing is um, this, but you could think of so-called autologous uh, transplantation, so you somehow save your own stem cell in a ba tissue bank, you know. I always felt that's a good idea, you know. I don't know anyone who pursues it, but um, um, in any event, moving on. Um, <laughs> the, um, another strategy would be to use various hormone treatments. Um, you know, of course, women sometimes um, take so-called uh, menopausal hormone therapy, and you can ask yourself, is there a benefit? And um, I evaluated the effect of hormone therapy in two tissues. One is blood, where we found no effect, no benefit, and also buckle swaps. So inside your mouth, uh, the, the, uh, the cells, they're so-called keratinocytes. They're in essence, they're skin cells. And there we did find a, a strong effect. So yes, women. And so the statement is: women who do, um, who take um, hormone therapy, menopausal hormone therapy, their skin is younger, according to the epigenetic clock, but not their blood. You know, and in general, um, um, menopausal hormone therapy is risky. You know, there's uh, um, by now most doctors advise against it. However, women will tell you who take it, many women say, well, there's a clear benefit visually on the skin. You know? And there's a biologic reason, because skin cells and keratinocytes have more estrogen receptors. They can uptake the treatment, whereas blood cells do not apparently have far fewer estrogen receptors. Conversely, um, women who undergo surgical menopause for various reasons, their epigenetic age increases a little bit. What about gender differences? So epigenetic clock studies show that, yes, women age more slowly than men, and it depends on the tissue. In blood, I want to say about a year, between one and two years, women are slightly younger than men. Um, we did, in brain tissue, the effect is much weaker, but there is an effect. Again, women would have a slight advantage. Um, we do so-called uh, um, longitudinal studies where we have multiple blood draws from people that may be separated by five to ten years. 
And here I show you these spaghetti plots that show how methylation age changes um, across age. And what you notice is if 10 years pass, then sure enough, methylation age increases by roughly 10 years, you know. If you have a good eye, you will notice there are a couple of people where there's this crazy reversal effect, okay? And so, um, so initially, they, their age may have been over 80, and suddenly, by the next follow-up, their age is 75 or so. Um, personally, I think these are simply technical artifacts, you know. So these, um, um, who knows what went wrong? Maybe the DNA extraction didn't work, or the person had some, I don't know what, you know. Um, it could be biological. It could be he had some uh, severe effect, um, um, infection. Who knows, you know. But overall, um, you see in 95% of people, it tracks the passage of time. Um, coming back to my pan tissue clock, I wanted to show you a detailed view. And this is the so-called untransformed um, methylation age estimate. And it, it, look at the x-axis. It starts at zero. And um, so these epigenetic clocks follow, allow you to measure aging in children, actually in prenatal samples, and it goes all the way up. But the other point you notice is that initially there's a faster rate of change. So during growth and development, um, the epigenetic changes are faster. After age 20, they are roughly linear, as you can see. Now, um, my pan tissue clock even applies to very early development. We're now studying here fetal retina samples. And you notice the scatter plot on the right-hand side is in um, correlation 0.8. So, and, and, but the axis is not years. This is days during fetal development, you know. So um, the view, why is that exciting? Because it shows... Um, it's not just um, the epigenetic clock doesn't just relate to aging, mortality, morbidity. No, it also relates to purposeful processes, namely um, developmental processes. And that gives rise to an epigenetic clock theory of aging. This methylation age is a continuous readout that links processes that play a role in development, in maintaining tissues, protecting against cancer, but then relating them in a continuous fashion to um, tissue dysfunction. So, um, so therefore, this is well within this framework that um, people call um, antagonistic pleiotropy. Sorry. So, oh, I think something terrible. Let me see. <laughs> um, total digression. I have a placental epigenetic clock. So you give me a piece of the placenta, I can tell you the gestational age of the baby, you know. But that clock is very different from all the other ones, you know. Um, and I want to talk, I also do a lot of studies, oh, sorry, let's just wait what happens. <laughs> um, I do a lot of studies in animals. Um, how much time is left? Oh, okay, good. Yeah, um, I study animals. Central question of bio, uh, biology going back all the way to Aristotle. Why do similar species, such as mammals, have markedly different lifespans? There's a huge literature on it, decades, maybe 100 years of literature. And um, here I show you one study um, by de Magal Hess, who looked at 3,000 animal species. And what drives maximum lifespan? Well, um, the ability to avoid predators. If you're a bigger animal, you live longer. If you can fly, you live longer, or, or, and so on. So um, avoiding predators is associated, ability to avoid predators relates to maximum lifespan. And um, after you adjust for body weight, there are some market outliers. For example, bats. Some bats have the size of a mouse, but live 30, 40 years, whereas a mouse lives three years. Another famous animal in aging studies is a naked mole rat, you know, which can live over 30 years. Again, most rats live, or mice and other rodents live shorter lives. What's their secret? They, um, 
there are many, uh, the, the question is, um, what are the molecular reasons? As I said, if you just ask, um, why does the naked mole rat live longer um, from an ecological perspective? Well, it can hide in the ground. It, uh, it avoids predators. But what are the molecular reasons? And I, as you can imagine, look at uh, methylation. And so I have a, a large project where I, I have already profiled over 10,000 animal tissues. And here's one answer, you know. So these are, this is a graph where on the y-axis I show you the maximum lifespan. By the way, maximum lifespan in humans would be around 122. And um, um, the x-axis shows you an estimate of the rate of change in methylation. And all is on a log scale. But I, I hope you can see that there's a very strong linear relationship, you know. So yes, methylation relates to maximum lifespan. But there are many other statistical analyses you can do, and that's what I do um, in my lab. So we do so-called phylogenetic regression. We want to find cytosines that have a strong relationship to maximum lifespan. These studies are unpublished, they're ongoing, but I can tell you we're getting phenomenal results. I mean, cytosine methylation very much relates to maximum lifespan. So the two insights. Rate of change in methylation explains at least 50% of the variation in maximum lifespan. And more generally, methylation relates to maximum lifespan across these mammals. Um, now... I, I have built epigenetic clocks for mice, for dogs. If you have a dog, I can measure the age. We have an epigenetic clock for the naked mole rat. We have a lot of a big emphasis on bat species. Why? Because some bats live five years, others 30 years. We want to find out um, why, which. So we have very accurate clocks for bats. Here the dots are colored by bat species, okay? We analyzed 30 different bat species. We have clocks for primates, uh, many primates. Um, I want to end by saying um, um, we actually have several epigenetic clocks. They have different purposes. All correlate strongly with chronologic age, but they differ very much in terms of predictive accuracy for mortality. We have some clocks that are wonderful for mortality risk prediction, grim age. Others, like pan tissue clock, wouldn't be as good. Um, now, these methylation data are predictive of mortality even after adjusting for many risk factors, as I highlighted. You adjust for age, body mass index, gender. It would still predict lifespan. Um, now, the question is, is it worth the trouble measuring methylation, right? Um, so, and that comes back to my earlier statement of the costs. Personally, I pay over $200 for such a measurement. And so if there's a company that um, they need to make, um, they need to evaluate the utility of methylation from a business sense. Is it worth the trouble? Um, I cannot speak to that because I'm not a business person. But... Um, I do want to say methylation age will never replace any of the other biomarkers you currently look at. It will never replace blood pressure, lipid levels, and so on. It will complement them, but not replace them. And um, when you do a methylation study, you need to think very carefully um, from what source you will get your DNA. Um, should it be blood? Should it be saliva, buccal swabs, urine, fat, muscle? Um, it is a practical question, um, but it's also a biological question. Um, I, of course, always focus on blood. Why? Because I use epidemiological cohort studies, and that's what they collected. But from a scientific point of view, it could very well be that liver, for example, or kidney, is a far better predictor of lifespan. You know, who knows? And we will look at that, of course, in mouse models, but just so that you know. And here's my acknowledgement slide of various fundings. I'm largely funded by NIH and the Paul Allen Foundation. Thank you. <coughs> Stop with that. Mm -hmm.
We have time for a couple of questions, so if you want to come to the microphone and ask your question, uh, feel free. It's a little handicap if you're on the edge or in the back row. Mm -hmm. Doug Andrews, thank you. Very interesting talk. Mm -hmm. You mentioned stress early on and then you didn't talk later. How does stress affect methylation and how do you measure that? And does it have a persistent effect when it can have intermittent effects throughout lifespan? Yeah, you know, there's a, a, a large body of research by now on the question of psychological stress versus um, epigenetic aging. Um, a very severe form of stress is post-traumatic stress disorder in soldiers, for example. And um, I remember, um, so for example, I saw a paper unpublished um, where PTSD was very much associated with increased grim age. Um, in general, though, overall, I would say psychological stress has... Um, um, has a very weak effect on my other clocks, you know, so uh, one needs to, you know, it's kind of uh, subtle. F fortunately, this short-term acute stress is probably not associated with accelerated aging on my, um, using my old clocks. It's all about long-term stress. So people who um, were, let's say, sexually abused as children. They had decades of stressed experiences, you know. Um, they are pe um, what people call cumulative lifetime stress. Their people, um, associations have been uh, found, you know. Short-term stress, hopefully less so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hi, Les Lohman. Uh, yeah. I was interested in your... Uh, uh, the uh, estrogen comments on blood and skin. Yes. I was wondering how much influence you think the phytoestrogens have. You know, these days a lot of people think that uh, the soy products, the non-GMO soy products, are really very healthy. And I've, I understand that for men there's not much of a difference, but that for women, in fact, they're, they're quite uh, dangerous, in fact. I guess it would make them look good and then kill them early. Uh, based on what you said earlier. Yes. And of course, then all endocrine uh, disruptors, what, any comments on that generally? Yeah, I mean, being, let me start with general comments. Being a man, I'm particularly interested in the effect of testosterone <laughs> supplementation, you know, but nobody has done this study. But in general, in women, um, as I said, um, we found a beneficial effect on skin, but really no effect whatsoever in blood, you know. And um, the other story I told you was growth hormones, you know. They seem to be a re an effect. Big picture is hormones play a role in these aging processes. And what is really needed is large-scale, careful studies where people investigate things. Unfortunately, with the, est um, um, the hormone replacement trials, um, they were stopped because there was a slight elevation of risk, you know, and um, in certain ways the baby was thrown out with the bathwater, you know. It would be nice to fine-tune the treatment so that you avoid the risks but get the benefits. When it comes to um, soy products, um, honestly, I have no insight on that at all, you know. Um, Personally, I, to be totally honest and speaking as a non-scientist, I don't drink soy milk because I'm nervous about that aspect, you know. Um, but yeah, <laughs> but then I'm a man because um, they say in women there could be a benefit. But as you know, um, in men, in general, um, there's um, this um, contamination with estrogens, and so yeah. Hi. Please. <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm Carl Polzer, a Center on Capital and Social Equity. <laughs> Wow, lots to think about. So I was very, very taken by your uh, reference to, you know, the innate pro uh, aging process and possibly evolution. So is it possible that innate aging is a regulator that's pot in the yes. um, competition for life and re reproduction? Yes. As between one species and another, either among groups of people, and if, if so, if we, you know, start putting things in our thymus as a subgroup, you know, to if we look at it individually, we might be increasing our lifespan and power and ability to enjoy life. But could could there be a negative effect in the, you know, the competitive fitness 
of the group as a whole. Does that make sense? Yes, it does, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think of it the same way. First of all, I think, um, well, l stepping back, there's a debate in the literature um, why do we see these methylation changes, you know? And the obvious answer is entropy. It's noise. As we age, things get messed up. And undoubtedly, that there's a huge role to entropy. But the question is, well, beyond entropy, could there be actually a purposeful um, program, you know, um, a pseudo-program? And I... I, I believe that is the case, you know. Um, very, why? Because, as I mentioned, these clocks apply to development. It's very hard to argue that in fetal retina development there's a lot of um, noise and entropy. It's all purposefully, carefully orchestrated. So, yes, I think um, initially methylation probably, as I said, relates to purposeful processes and only later in life things go wrong, you know. Um, and like everything in life is so complicated, it's all balancing act. If you overdo one thing, there will be adverse consequences. So I have no doubt that, yes, if we optimize, for example, maximum lifespan, no doubt there could be uh, side effects. But that's really a um, problem of the next generation. I would love to have that problem that people live 160 and then suddenly develop side effects. That, that would be a good problem, you know. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. But yes. Hi, Steve. I'm Tom Pearls. It's really nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. I thought it was a great talk, and I think the, the uh, scientific aspects are very intriguing. Um, my one concern was the interventions, um, and I supplement what the previous person asked about hormones. Um, so uh, this audience, more than any I know, is very interested in more long-term outcomes rather than short-term <laughs> outcomes. And yes, women look uh, more vibrant when they take estrogen, but it's been well shown that long-term effects include increased heart attack, stroke, mortality, and cancer um, for estrogen. Um, your comment that Growth hormone is um, relatively innocuous, I think is false. Um, there's a number of studies showing about a 15% increased risk of um, diabetes in mice, certainly an increased risk for um, cancer. And um, mouse models that are deficient in growth hormone live a lot longer. And there's a bunch of other evidence. So my question about this um, study of nine, now study of a hundred. Um, I'm a little surprised that IRBs are approving that study because of these effects of growth hormone. Um, but also, yeah, you show short-term improvements, and I wonder what the effects of a um, better epigenetic clock are in terms of risk of cancer. So you, you know, I think there's a chance that there's this nice short-term improvement, but it could be a marker of increased risk for cancer. Yes. Well, I'm really glad you reminded everyone of these risks, certainly of female hormone therapy, um, absolutely. I mean, to me, it's hopefully well known, you know, but um, absolutely. Um, I emphasize that medical doctors really advise against it, you know, so um, um, I wanted to, um, regarding the growth hormone, that's a very important point. So yes, uh, growth hormones have actually several side effects. Uh, you mentioned the diabetogenic effect, which is uh, probably the most uh, disconcerting, but also there's fluid retention, you know, so people really don't like that, you know. There are many side effects to growth hormones. That's why, why the NIA stopped it. What I will say is that's why Greg Fahey added metformin, right? The, uh, so the idea is take growth hormone, but add an, um, a diabetes drug. And so these people were very carefully uh, monitored by m medical doctors uh, on a weekly basis that tracked very much these hormone levels, also IGF-1, to, to ensure that they uh, remained in the normal range. With the mouse models, um, as you said, there are many studies that show actually lower, uh, let's say if you knock out growth hormone receptor, the mouse lives much longer. And also the epigenetic clock studies show it, you know. 
Um, the, the thing here was um, growth hormone was administered short term in a middle aged group. So it could very well be that growth hormones early in, um, during growth and development could have very bad effects, but later in life a short term intervention could have a benefit. You know. But yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, we'll yeah. have to we'll stop question yeah. shorts. I'm around for the Sorry for, yeah, exactly. So uh, for the people that have questions, uh, please approach the podium uh, after I do the closing here. We're running a little bit late. So thank you again, Dr. Horvath, for your insights. I think especially from a, a medical and underwriting perspective, we can see uh, the usefulness of that work. So thank you again. Thank you.